Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show. You got in... Over here! ...with a friend and found a spot close enough to see the set list. They're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! Hello, welcome to another episode of the Celtics Lab podcast. I am your current host, Alex Goldberg. Cameron, our usual host, is out for today, so I'm going to be taking over host duties. And we have got, boy, have we got a lot to get to. So, um, as always, with me is Justin Quinn, our other co-host of the Celtics Lab podcast. How are you doing today, Mr. Quinn? Uh, Could be better. uh, Have some bad familial news i won't get into on the show relative past got news a little bit before we started recording uh but that is really honestly only one of many reasons i am not very happy today which we can talk about that's true we have plenty more to talk about and to talk about all sorts of different things and to get into the weeds with boy a whole lot of stuff concerning the celtics and some of their arch rivals as well we welcome return of dave zirin from the nation dave how are you doing I'm good. I just got to say it's Zyron. Not You're Zyron. right. It is Zyron. It's okay. I totally butchered that, but we'll do it uh, right. And going forward, it'll be it'll be fine. Sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> it's, your, it's your job. Whoever's hosting Actually, has to mull the names. Yeah, that's true. I <laughs> just read this article about Maya Rudolph saying she cried when Dave Letterman called her a Maya Rudolph. And I was just like, then you're an amateur. Because <laughs> day of my life. <laughs> Including once from my mom. Oh, man. From your mom. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, of her I, I don't know anybody who screwed up your name. <laughs> All I, right. I, I called him Mike for some strange reason when I emailed oh, him. Oh, yeah. That was show. I don't even know where that came from. I wasn't even talking to anyone named Mike. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We're off to a roaring start. Anyway, um, we have a lot to get into, and there's probably no place better to start than the breaking news that was reported over the past couple of hours, uh, courtesy of Woj and Shams. It appears that Steve Nash is out as the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets, and former Celtics head coach Ime Udoka is in as the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets in what appears to be uh, six games into his suspension or I guess seven games into his suspension uh, for a personal misconduct violations from the Celtics last year. Um, he appears to be now the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets and will no longer be serving that suspension and will be, I guess, packing his bag and going to Brooklyn. So Dave, we're going to sway it to you first. Initial first thoughts, reactions. What, what was, what did you kind of feel when you saw this news break? What the <laughs> fuck that's what i thought because we still don't know let's take it back a second we still don't know really why ime udoka was suspended but i have to assume it was pretty bad based on the tone of his letter that he sent and i just refuse to believe he cat called someone in the hallway uh who he had a consensual relationship with or didn't I mean, just give me a break. And the second thing I thought was, what kind of suspension is this then that lets you leave after a month? They make this big deal. He's suspended for a year. And then a month and a half later, he's, or not even, I guess, he's, he's coaching again. High profile gig. And then the next thing I thought was Brooklyn Nets, the only explanation that makes sense is that they want to distract from Kyrie Absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> oldest trick in the book. I mean, this is what hand magic is all about. The okie doke, 
Get you looking one way instead of the other. It's the only thing that makes sense because they know that hiring Ime Udoka comes with a shitload of bad publicity. And I'm sorry, but Ime Udoka is not, you know, Vince Lombardi. You know, I mean, he's a fine coach, but he's done it one year. They could have hired Sam Cassell, former net. You know, I mean, a, a, a worthy choice. I mean, frankly, there are a lot of people they could have hired commensurate yeah. with Ime Adoka. So then you have to ask the question, why him? And I'm telling you, it's hand magic. It's up close magic. It's the bait and switch. Yeah. It's, it's the only thing that makes sense. It, my head was spinning as well. There's a lot to unpack. JQ, immediate reaction from you. Uh, exactly what you guys said. There is something going on here probably distracting from negative publicity with less negative publicity uh we can get into the the, you know the contours of the whole situation but i mean even from just like a strictly basketball perspective it seems like a really poor fit i mean you have two of the people who respond the worst in the nba to criticism going for captain accountability who is clearly not being held accountable in any reasonable assessment of of that that word this is just like there was a good tweet going around on uh the elon musk future hellhole that is twitter that basically pointed to uh, Jason Mendoza from the uh, series. What is the name of the series on Netflix? Well, it doesn't matter. The the, the character uh, is basically an idiot. And he said something to the effect of, well, you know, I had a problem. So I threw a Molotov cocktail on it. And then I immediately had a different problem. And that's basically (laughs) the best summation of the Nets this season I've ever seen. I'm sorry, uh, Alex. Can I just give one other thought? I have to be honest with you. The Please. the first thought that actually entered my mind because I'd been thinking about this anyway, so I was kind of like, bam, there it is, is that how remarkable is it that twice in nine years, the Nets assemble a super team that flops in spectacular fashion and both teams are headed by first year head coaches with Hall of Fame credentials, point guards even, with Hall yeah. of Fame credentials. Like the fact that they were able to duplicate that twice in nine years, to me is just a remarkable Hall of Fame worthy act of incompetence. <laughs> the Celtics yeah. are like deep in it too. It's, it's fascinating. There's a million different contours and things that you know will come to light with the story as it develops. Um, in terms of immediate reactions, the one thing that jumped out to me was the speed with which it went from the Nets have fired Steve Nash to the Nets are looking at multiple candidates to the Nets have hired Ime Udoka. That does not seem to align with the idea that the Brooklyn Nets did any sort of thorough vetting process uh, regarding Udoka or the kind of... Um, reasons that he was suspended or at really any of that it, the speed was dizzying um to the point where it strikes me that the only reasonable two explanations for that are one that the brooklyn nets um just did a kind of like box ticking check where they had their lawyers you know kind of read whatever they read and come back and say no this looks fine go for it or um that there was active tampering going on for months probably as soon as the suspension Encouraged if not even bring, frankly if if not even before um there's just it it does not pass the sniff test so but but, but, but this whole th- i'm sorry to interrupt you no I just, please i just like even calling it tampering though it's like the 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 suspension was so amorphous and unlike anything we've seen in the Adam Silver era, partly, of course, because it wasn't under Adam Silver's auspices, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, so out of tone with, like, to to use your turn of phrase about Adoka, accountability NBA, and Adam Silver being very good at getting, unlike Roger Goodell, of getting out in front of things instead of just being this sort of reactionary weather vane to whatever he thinks is the latest trending topic. Uh, This was different. And so tampering, it's almost like I'm like tampering with what? 
Yeah. No. Is it tampering uh, if both teams want this to happen? Because it seems to me the main characteristic yeah. here was Wick didn't Wick Grasbeck, the the co owner, didn't want to pay Udoka's contract. Uh, was trying to avoid a legal battle, thus the lack of interest in compensation being reported by the Globe's Adam Himmelsbeck, uh, being sought by the Celtics. Uh, so really, the main the main criteria here is: could he improve things that are bad on this team? Could he maybe get rid of people on this team we don't want through his coaching style? And probably the most important factor is this fire, dumpster fire that we have here. That we're about to bring on a more desirable dumpster fire than the one we have in the laps right now. Yeah, I have a really hard time believing that Kyrie Irving, Ben Simmons, and Kevin Durant are going to vibe with Emi Udoka's aggressive coaching style. We'll see. I just, it's, it's a strange move. I think there's a lot of possible reasons behind it that some of which we've alluded to already. Um, and, you know, it just kind of speaks to the general turmoil that's going on in the Brooklyn Nets organization. And re- really from the top down, it seems like. Um, any kind of final thoughts on Ime, the hiring, uh, the firing of Steve, Steve Nash, which we really haven't touched on at all. Um, weird. This is, yeah. this is where it gets weird again. Steve Nash... Uh, is fired, and then the official word is that it was a mutual parting of the ways, which has, you know, contractual implications and all the rest of it. And so so this feels like it was something that was set up from a while back. And it was sort of like Joseph Tsai, like if Nash is not cutting it, you know, in, if Kyrie is acting like Kyrie, uh, and, and Nash can't do anything about it, then maybe Adoka is the answer. And they set this in motion. Did they do due diligence? We, we should find that out at the first press conference if they know things we don't know. I don't see how, though, with more people knowing if it, how it's going to be kept under wraps, my inclination is to think they did no due diligence. And... Uh, or if they did, it was of the BS variety. Yeah. The other thing, the other final thought is, you know, I read this on Twitter, so take it with a grain of salt, that Adoka was Kyrie's choice mm. and was promoted by Kyrie inside the organization. Is that true? I don't know. Why am I saying it? Because it wouldn't surprise me, given how this operation has gone in the last couple of years. So part of what I'm saying is, even if not true, it's interesting that that would be something that you could say, yeah, I could see that. Well, there is definitely some evidence that Yudoko was well-liked by Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily enough to go off of like, he was their choice per se, but he certainly had a strong relationship with those guys. And I think that's been evident for a little bit now. Um, And given that Kevin Durant apparently named one of his frustrations with the Nets uh, during his trade saga this past summer as the head coach, Steve Nash, and his not liking Nash's leadership style. It wouldn't surprise me that given that Yudoka and Durant and Irving were close, clearly when Yudoka was there, and that Durant seems like he wanted Nash out of the door, it wouldn't shock me if these things all kind of came together in that way. Um, so we, there's more to talk about with the Brooklyn Nets, and we will get into that in just a moment. We're going to pause to take an ad read, and then we're going to do a deep dive into even more turmoil with regard to this. But uh, before we do that, basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all sports wagering information, BetOnline features live betting, free contests, and live scores, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest and easiest way to bet all of your favorite sports events, including NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, and even golf. Head over to BetOnline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code CLNS50 to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. So um, we have more stuff to talk about with regard to the Brooklyn Nets and everything else that's going on around them. And apologies to any other Nets podcasts if we are stepping on their toes. 
Um, but I think we we mentioned it earlier and we have to kind of talk about the current situation with regard to Kyrie Irving, um, the anti-Semitic documentary that he retweeted, his subsequent response to that. And, you know, Dave, you have written pretty extensively about this as well as numerous other social issues for the nation. You have a new piece up on it now as well. Um, and we thought while you were here, we would try and get into some of the history on kind of what is a really sensitive and frankly, for me at least, personal issue, um, speaking as a Jewish American. So um, we're really happy to have you here. Before we begin, um, can you just kind of take us through the piece a little bit without you know, spoiling it so that other people can read it? <laughs> of course. I mean, the, the, the real thesis of the piece is that what we're looking at here is something qualitatively different than the his, the, the very fraught, at times extremely tense history between uh, black and Jewish communities. Uh, it's a complicated history and I go through the history in the article of some moments of incredible uniting to achieve really important social goals for black people and Jewish people. It, it was a, it was a two way street. Uh, and yet there's also a history of tension that I, for, for very basic economic reasons about how inner city urban areas uh, transferred populations over time, uh, which, which in the, the northern ghettos meant the Jews who used to live there were still small business owners and basically the face of authority to black communities. And um, James Baldwin actually has uh, an amazing essay about that up from the New York Times from 50 years ago called Why Black People Are Anti-Semitic, a very strong title that basically, though, makes a similar argument to the one that I'm making, uh, which is that you have to understand socially why that's the case. And once you understand it socially, uh, you can you can fight against it. But and, and we, we can talk about fighting against it. And, and I made some arguments in the piece about, you know, basic logic about why so much of this anti-Semitism is, is such garbage, garbage politics, garbage ideas, uh, garbage lies like Jewish cabal, controlling media, controlling the world, all that stuff is pure Nazi fascist trash. Um, but, but what's different about Kyrie, and this was really the point of the article, is that unlike some of this fraught history, which uh, has included, you know, everything from, you know, anti-Semitism and hip hop lyrics to, uh, to, you know, tensions in the streets of, uh, of Crown Heights in Brooklyn, unlike something like that, uh, Kyrie is having allies who never before allied with these kinds of politics that have existed uh, in, in, in communities of color. Um, and those politics are the hardcore right-wing Christo-fascist uh, edge um, of our society. You know, the Steve Bannons, the Marjorie Taylor Greens. It's like to, to see people offer support not only to Kyrie, but to Kanye West, and to see that support echoed on Twitter feeds of the GOP. Yeah. I mean, this is different. This is different. And I wanted to, diff that's why I wanted to write the piece in the first place. Like we need to know the history of black Jewish relations. We need to understand that there's tension in that history, but we also need to understand that what Kyrie is doing is not that. And sure. that's really important because the risk comes with, you know, people with incredible platforms echoing this. Like we've already seen a couple of uh, white nationalist events with slogans like Kanye was right, you know, things like that. And it's, and that, that's why this needs to be challenged. Uh, and it needs to be challenged forthrightly, whether Kyrie is willing to change his mind or not. We need an atmosphere that has zero tolerance for this. It's also yeah. important because there hasn't, since the Holocaust, honestly, there hasn't been a moment like this with not just a national in the United States movement towards fascism, but a global movement towards authoritarianism, that if what became more inflected with this kind of speech becomes a natural scapegoat kind of a thing, that again, we have not seen since the Holocaust, and we have seen what happens when authoritarian governments find it a useful scapegoat for exactly the stuff you talk about in your article. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. I well, I was just going to jump in and say, you know, you mentioned Kanye West and kind of the platform that he has. And really, that's kind of where this story starts, at least in my mind. Um, so obviously, Kanye West is, you know, a rapper. He's a fashion designer and he is an enormously influential person uh, in the course of the 21st century with, you know, millions of fans that, you know, and some of whom we should clarify are appalled at this and and rightfully so but some of whom are not and some of whom are siding with Kanye um this has obviously not been his first rodeo around problematic issues uh regarding race religion etc um but you know recently he has really ramped this up in a kind of frightening and public fashion and speaking as somebody who is both Jewish and also was a pretty big fan of Kanye West's music at one point um, to see this kind of train crash that's happening before our eyes has been uh, really disturbing. Um, and it's led to some implications for Kanye. Obviously, he's lost his Adidas sponsorship. Uh, he has lost uh, a number of sponsorships from other brands, Balenciaga. Uh, the Donda Academy that he founded has been closed. Uh, still not exactly clear why, although at least part of it appears to be that Kanye at Kanye's directive. Um, it's it's confusing because they they reopened it supposedly. Uh, a letter was circulated and it is technically, as far as I know, still open. But their first game against Morehouse College was just canceled. So it's, right. it's in this weird limbo, and he's not helping. And so this is all culminated in like events like the past couple of days, where now Kanye West is literally sharing Stormfront propaganda uh, when being interviewed. I mean, this red media thing that he's doing where he's holding up uh, graphs with the names of all Jewish media members, which is one, flagrantly wrong. It's just literally a lie. Half of it is wildly inaccurate. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, you know, the fact that this is a piece that has been cited on Stormfront by actual neo-Nazi uh, and by actual like white supremacist groups, not just in like their kind of general creed and belief system, but also quite literally in, you know, manifestos of people who have committed violent acts, such as the Buffalo shooter. Um, it, it's been a particularly fraught time with Kanye West. Um, but how, where this kind of ties back into basketball is there's, there's, there's kind of two angles that we can talk about this. Um, I do want to mention that, you know, we are in the Celtics Lab podcast and we this this story affects the Celtics as well. Um, Jalen Brown obviously responded to some of the dropping of Kanye West by these brands and the kind of general kerfuffle around uh, the closing of Donda Academy. Um, and his initial response did not mention any anti-Semitism and did not mention any particular uh, issue with Kanye West. Um, he followed up by offering a clearer and more definitive reply condemning anti-Semitism writ large. But um, he, his main area of concern seemed to be uh, primarily with the fate of the kids who were at Donda Academy and their inability to uh, attend that school anymore and their inability to participate in the athletics program, which he was fairly involved in. So that was a pretty significant store, sore spot for him. Um, that being said, Jalen Brown's response to Kanye West's kind of resurgent anti-Semitism, while maybe not the outright condemnation in the same way that perhaps myself and other people were hoping for, was very different from Kyrie Irving's. Um, I'm curious, Dave, did you have any kind of thoughts or response to Jalen Brown's responses to Kanye West at all? Well, it was a reminder for me that um, athletes rarely move even athletes of great principle like Jalen Brown is like rarely move without social movements and rumblings from outside the arena. And if we expect them to be the ideal expression of, we would want them to say, uh, I think we're, we're kind of fooling ourselves or being overly romantic about, and I, and I, you know, I, I've chronicled activist athletes my whole career. I mean, you know, I'm, I could be excused. Of, I could be. I'm accused of romanticism at different points. Uh, but but this is what's you know was drilled into my head by by my mentors. You know, it's like 
It always starts off the field. It always starts off the court. So do we have a mass anti-racist movement in this country that also incorporates fighting anti-Semitism that links the issues together in an intersectional manner? We sure as hell don't. And so the, the absence of that uh, creates a social context where I think for a lot of people, um, the, particularly I have to say, like um, amongst oppressed groups, the instinct is to huddle together and link arms against a white power structure that's seen as tearing them apart. So that becomes, and similarly uh, with Kyrie, it's like, uh, I, I've spoken to NBA, NBA players a lot. Like it's rare you'll find one who will speak out publicly against another player. Uh, there's considered to be a code in that regard. Tragically, I think that code really started about, you know, criticizing a player on the court, but we live in much more politically uh, difficult times where it's going to become necessary for players to say to other players, like, hey, that's bullshit. And, and I want to be on record as saying it's so. I mean, I just feel like we have a lot of work to do off the court if we want to see the responses shaped in a way that would be better than I think, frankly, Jalen Brown did in this process. JQ, anything to add there? Yeah, I also think about, you know, when I was 26 years old, I was also an activist and not what I consider myself now uh, to be an organizer uh, at the service of people in allyship uh, and accomplish it really more than anything. And that's a crucial difference just because of the fact that when I was his age, I centered myself in my actions and I didn't follow people so much as envision myself as a protagonist in this fight. Uh, and I wonder if maybe Jalen is going through a similar, you know, education I found from very generous and thoughtful people who tolerated my stupidity, uh, trying to help them. In my ignorance, uh, I realized that the way I should have been dealing with things is listening to the people who are affected that I wanted to help following their lead, centering them, their voices, and falling in line behind their activities. Uh, when, for example, people want to say, well, this isn't even anti I see this so much on Twitter lately. This isn't anti-Semitism. The meaning of anti-Semitism is this. And so we have to like, kind of like have the same energy when we want to have people take our causes seriously uh, as ourselves, as we give to others. And if we want people to take, for example, anti-Black racism seriously, we should listen to the Black people and their opinions on what counts as racism in the same way that we should do that with, with anti-Semitic stuff. So like when we see uh, articles or tweets or other forms of media saying alleged uh, anti-Semitic video being shared by Kyrie, it's not alleged. It's very clearly, and we shouldn't, as media or as individuals, participate in that kind of a discourse. Yeah, my, my um, wow, very well said. Um, my, my my one addition to that would be that, uh, you know, when we talk about fighting anti-Semitism, I mean, there's a lot we need to reckon with because our community is so divided, so divided politically including we have seen this uh right-wing jews who have you know fierce defenses of israel which i do not um in allyship with the actual white nationalists who inspire the people who shoot up our synagogues i don't think there's anything commensurate to that in oppressed communities partly because jews have existed i think in this sort of weird purgatory of conditional whiteness for at least 80 years. Um, and this is the first to, to go what you were saying about, you know, authoritarian government. This is the first time, certainly in my lifetime, where I felt the weight of the conditional part more than the whiteness. Yeah. And I know right now it's largely on the fringes, but you hear it being echoed by one of the two major political parties, including their leader. And that's the popularization of right-wing and fascistic ideas in a way that I think was very isolated before social media. 
and before influencers. Yeah, I think, you know, as someone who is also very much feeling the weight of conditionality, um, it's it's definitely it we we do want specific things from our heroes, right? We want things from uh people that we look up to and admire. And uh, I don't want to disrespect anything that Jalen Brown has done because he is a figure worthy of admiration. You know, I think Very much some, so. of the, some of the stuff that he's been doing as an activist, some of the stuff that he's been doing, uh, getting involved, uh, you know, using his platform and his financial ability to help kids in need. I think that's that's a really important thing that we can't let get lost in this conversation. Jalen Brown has done a lot of good work as a human being, even if some of the kind of ways that he approaches it, you know, these conversations maybe uh, is not necessarily the response that I speaking again as a Jewish person would love to see. But I think we are right in saying that um, it's probably unrealistic to ask people to be, uh, you know, to, to have a perfect response to things like that when there isn't, a kind of greater sense of solidarity across communities, a greater kind of network built up of, um, you know, people kind of pushing back against authoritarianism and fascism and racism from a variety of angles. And part of the work that we all have to do is in kind of building that space so that um, when incidents like this happen, we can kind of better assess and judge and react as a whole community rather than as people kind of in isolated silo, silos of race, ethnicity, religion, et cetera. Um, you know, to that end, I do think we should probably move on to kind of the other piece of this, which is that there have been other responses to this rising tide of anti-Semitism in the world and media in the NBA. Uh, and some of them have been explicitly not helped. Join over 1 million players at ChumbaCasino.com, America's favorite online social casino. Play for free at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The people who looked through 200 resumes to fill a job also waited 40 minutes for their internet to dial up. You don't wait 40 minutes for your internet to dial up. You use Upwork to quickly hire talent. This is how we work now. Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers. Cooper helping to forward that goal. So, of course, we have to, yeah, what, really quick, JQ. Uh, I want to touch on a, a good segue to that in that both Kyrie and Jalen have had some issues with the frame of this, right? There there seems to be, on Jalen, a much more benign form of this where he seems to be struggling a bit, maybe not so much now, but at least initially with association, right? And the impact of being associated with certain ideas, certain certain. Uh, media, et cetera, right? So for him, that seemed to be a problem. Kyrie even more so, but like when confronted about it in that press conference with Nick Friedel, which we can talk a little bit about, I think that's where you're maybe going with it. Uh, yeah. he, he had some really big problems with being you know, held accountable for the associations that people are having, which are, again, completely justified. Uh, you can We can talk a bit more about what is actually in the book referenced by Kyrie. Uh, and to me, that also is an issue of media literacy with the fans of these people, right, who don't even seem to necessarily know, A, what Kanye said, what Kanye has done since then, completely or at all, uh, and are just kind of going through this, like, echo chamber of, of you know, mentions and, and echoes and whatever. Uh, and then at the same time, there is this, like, lack of media awareness of how how communication functions historically with these issues and how once this like association gets into people's heads, you know, positively and negatively, it's really hard to break those connections. Yeah. So just to kind of segue into for the listeners at home, um, what we're talking about here, 
Uh, so Kyrie Irving posted on his Twitter a link to a documentary based off of a book. The title is called Hebrews to Negroes. It is an anti-Semitic documentary, uh, which, among other things, claims that Jews are responsible for the slave trade, that the current American international Jewish community is made up of imposters and that Black people are the real Jews and God's chosen, that Jews rule every industry in the world and are helping Satan to deceive the world, that Jews invented anti-Black racism, that many famous Jews worship Satan, and uh, liberally quotes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a famously fabricated anti-Semitic piece of propaganda um, that was published in Tsarist Russia as an attempt to gin up popular support for political and social violence against Jewish people has been frequently employed by Nazis, by uh, other anti-Semitic groups as a way to justify um, attacks and violence against Jewish people. In addition, this documentary also has a quote in it, which is attributed to Adolf Hitler. It is not, not necessarily provable, but uh, the implication of the quote, which I won't read the whole uh, quote, I'm just going to paraphrase here, um, basically suggests that uh, American and white Jews know that Black people are the real Jews and that they are hiding them uh, and uh, hiding that secret from the world. And that is why America and Americans are so hell-bent on stopping Nazis. Um, that is, of course, not a verifiable or provable quote. It is nonetheless an extremely harmful one. And in general, this documentary is just absolutely loaded with anti-Semitic tropes, uh, lies, slander, just basically all sorts of mess. Um, Kyrie posted this to his Twitter and then shortly afterwards tweeted something of an apology uh, in kind of air quotes for the listeners at home, in which he claimed to not disrespect anyone's beliefs, that the anti-Semitic label is being pushed on him by the media and not justified. Uh, this led to a press conference after the Nets lost to the Pacers a couple days ago, uh, in which Kyrie Irving was pressed by uh, a number of reporters, including Nick Friedel, as to why he promoted this on his page. He responded, uh, and I'm quoting here, can you please stop calling it a promotion? What am I promoting? And then Glenn goes on to say, don't dehumanize me up here. In that press conference, he also claimed that uh, he video that he posted to his Instagram a while back of Alex Jones talking about occults in America is true. Um, and this was met with widespread condemnation from NBA media, from the press, uh, from Jake Tapper, you know, all sorts of people kind of responded to this. Um, we're not going to get into all of the responses, but if there's a particularly eloquent one to point out, Richard Jefferson did a really nice job responding to this. So listeners, uh, take a listen to that one. Um, Nike has condemned the statement. Uh, in addition, uh, the NBA Players Association recently released a statement uh, condemning that as well. And Kyrie last night faced some courtside protesters uh, sitting at the Brooklyn Nets game wearing shirts that said fight anti-Semitism on them. Um, Ray Allen, among others, felt the need to recirculate a piece on why he went to Auschwitz visiting uh, Holocaust Memorial there. Um, th this has caused a huge reaction in the NBA community uh, from a variety of different areas. What it hasn't caused is much action. Kyrie Irving is not in danger of being suspended, it would appear for this. Uh, he is not in danger of seeing any sort of financial penalty. So a, a big reaction, not a lot of action. Uh, Dave, break it down for us. What are we, what are we dealing with here? And what might be some of the long-term consequences well, I don't want to overgeneralize from this, but I got a phone call uh, yesterday from an NBA team that I don't want to name about if I could facilitate and introduce somebody to speak to the team about anti-Semitism. And I was like, first I was like, wow, that's amazing that you're being proactive. And the response I got was more reactive than proactive. Like one of the things that the issue with Kyrie does is it, like I was talking about this before, is that it can breed a sense of, 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 a, of a weird kind of solidarity because of the code. 
And unfortunately, the code has political implications because it's just the same way a lot of players in the NFL became radicalized by standing with Colin Kaepernick because first they were doing it just to support Cap. And then it was like their eyes were open and they were very educated about police violence and how it operates in our society and that they could do something about it and were getting noticed. This similarly is like the, the ugly funhouse mirror of that where you know choosing to just stand with Kyrie will eventually mean trying to understand what he's saying, renting the movie. It has this kind of effect. And I'm glad this particular team is being proactive and how to deal with it. But it's also just like, it's grim, you know, like they're going to, you know, go to a, a Holocaust organization to speak. And it's just like, we're really doing this. It just, it just is disheartening in that regard. Also, if we're talking about good things that people said, you know, I'm not like some big fan of this guy and I never think of him as a political source ever, but Rich Eisen. Um, yeah, he had, he had a really nice response as well. Yeah, it goes to what Justin was saying about, you know, about us being able to articulate what is or isn't anti-Semitic. And Rich Eisen didn't so much speak like we're speaking uh, he pretty much talked about how it made him feel inside and how what he heard right away, which was, of course, what we heard <laughs> right away. And to hear that get sort of validated collectively by a voice like that was to me something that made that, you know, got me to not slump so much in my chair. Yeah, I think, you know, speaking personally as well, it's been a really disheartening couple of days, uh, particularly, you know, as uh, as a Jewish American, but also just as a basketball fan, um, to see a real ambassador for the sport in Kyrie Irving, regardless of whether you think he is, you know, in the right or not, Kyrie Irving is a massive figure in the NBA. He is incredibly important as a media ambassador for all sorts of reasons. Uh, he is also a players union VP. He wields power within Important. the NBA structure. Jalen Brown too. Jalen Brown too. And to see a pretty kind of lackluster response, uh, very much in accordance with the code, as you mentioned, Dave, it, it was pretty disheartening for me as a basketball fan. And it, it did not make me feel particularly welcome, which is kind of upsetting because, you know, I'm on the Celtics Lab podcast. I love watching the Celtics. They're, they're my favorite sports team, and uh, the NBA is my favorite league. So th this was a tough. This was a tough moment for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, baseball and basketball and all of these sports. We don't think about it. Uh, not so much football, but deep roots in Jewish communities, for sure, and yeah. uh, that that go to the very soul of it, where. It's like I used to play catch for hours with my grandfather who came to this country. And for him, it was part of feeling included in this country. And, but, but basketball too. Oh my yeah. goodness. Goes back way before Dolph Shays, that's for sure. And Dolph because, Shays, because, good it's the, because it's the city game. You know, straight up, it's the city game and who were in the cities at the turn of the century. I mean, I just, I'm doing this book about the uh, historian who was Jewish, Howard Zinn, wrote People mm. in the History of the United States. I know in Boston, he probably could have run for mayor. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as I'm learning about Howard Zinn's life, one of the things he did was he was uh, a teenager working on the docks uh, in Brooklyn, and he was trying to organize uh, the, his work, the fellow workers into a union. And one of the ways he was able to get the young workers uh, was he started a basketball team. And uh, they, they, they played together, they bonded, and they eventually fought and won the union. And I just, I, I love that so much, that a bunch of uh, children of immigrants, a bunch of Jewish guys working on the docks, uh, you know, decided to play some ball and then fight the boss. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it really is powerful. It, it, sports is so many, in, in so many instances, really has a power to bring people together and, you know, kind of make, make these special relationships that wouldn't 
often exists and bring these different communities together. Um, and, you know, sports, sports has a power to do that, but it also has a power uh, to be a destructive element in society. And to that end, um, we thought we'd take a moment to kind of just talk about the history of anti-Semitism in sports, highlighting one particular example. I'm a history teacher. Cameron is a history teacher as well, even though he's not here. Uh, Justin has extensive expertise in this area as well, um, more so than me in some ways. But, uh, you know, uh, the kind of the, the moment that this brought up for me uh, thinking about was the 1936 Olympics, uh, which for those who are listening and don't know, um, was intended, it was hosted in Germany and it was intended uh, at the time to be a showcase for Aryan supremacy. Hitler was in power. The Nazi party was very much on the march, uh, but there was concern at the time from the international community that, uh, you know, the anti-Semitism that was kind of running rampant in Germany would become a greater problem, which of course it did. Uh, the 1936 Olympics was intended to showcase both the Aryan supremacy myth as well as uh, Germany on a world stage operating as a kind of equal to Britain and the United States and France and all of these different places. Um, some history around the Olympics just really quickly. Jewish athletes were largely banned from participating for the German teams. Um, many nations boycotted, but ultimately most nations, ultimately they joined and went to the Olympics. Um, the kind of iconic moment in American history for these Olympics was uh, led by Jesse Owens, the black sprinter, who dealt a significant PR blow to Hitler's showcase by winning gold at numerous track and field events uh, and really blowing up the myth of this superior Aryan athlete on a national stage. For that, Jesse Owens is considered a revered American hero, both in kind of American history and also in black history as well. Um, but regardless of that individual triumph from Owens, uh, the Munich Olympics was largely considered to be a triumph for the Nazis in terms of what, what they were able to, sorry, the Berlin Olympics, good call. Um, the the uh, Berlin Olympics were largely considered a triumph for the Nazis on the international stage uh, and set the tone for them as a society that was more acceptable and more normal and that should be considered a peer in this kind of community of nations. Uh, in some cases, very literally painting over the rising tide of anti-Semitic violence brewing in Germany. And by literally painting over, I mean painting over signs and shop windows and pieces of propaganda uh, that would later be uncovered and used uh, in the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, and this success largely bled into German society generally. Um, athletic institutions started adopting Nazi and discriminatory policies. Uh, one such example is the German Soccer Federation or DFB, which banned Jewish players, journalists, coaches, etc. shortly after the Olympics finished. Um, I have a quote here from a study from Duke University, uh, which says that the consensus was that German soccer helped to stabilize the Hitler regime, failed to do anything for the Jews, and in some areas was overly eager to please Nazis, even if its overall level of support for the regime only mirrored that of the public. And another quote from BBC suggesting that Europe's right-wing dictatorships pounced on the working man's support, uh, sport as a means for drumming up support of their politics. So this is an instance in which, you know, we're citing the kind of 1936 Berlin Olympics because sports matters when it comes to the ideological and social priorities of a society. Sports is a rallying tool. It is something that brings communities together. And in those communities, if we aren't careful to counteract messages of anti-Semitism, if we aren't careful to counteract messages of racism or discrimination or hatred, sports can become an immensely powerful tool for rallying support to those ideas in the form of team and player support uh, particularly when those players or teams align with these fascist movements. And as we have seen in American politics, as we have seen in a number of different as uh, aspects of society, regardless of whether people believe something in their hearts to be true, if there is political, social, economic momentum towards that thing being a priority for 
whatever audience, um, you can rally a shocking amount of people to support those causes, even if uh, on their face, they seem to be reprehensible and pretty basic. Um, was, yeah, Justin. There was something you mentioned in there too that can bring us full circle to Kanye in that there was a brother, a pair of brothers, German brothers who started a shoe company and they used Jesse Owens as the, their uh, primary mode of uh, publicity because they knew that the controversy surrounding him would get them lots and lots of attention. So they gave him some spike cleats. Uh, it was a great success. Uh, these two German brothers, uh, while happy to use the image of the whole Nazi regime uh, trying to make a spectacle of that situation to prove you know, Aryan superiority and betting against it, they still went along with the Nazi regime. Uh, one of them only believed it supposedly uh, superficially just going along with things. Uh, the other was quite fervent in his beliefs and would later split into Puma and Adidas. Yep. Dave, thoughts on, well, all that. <laughs> I mean, I, th there's um, just as a word of, of I guess, uh, hope and horror. Um Part of the history of the 36 Olympics is that there was a serious, serious fight uh, among the amateur athletic union uh, about whether we should go, which was a big deal because, you know, this isn't the time of social media. So people don't really know what's happening in Germany or, you know, other than a lot of Jews who are getting and other other people felt endangered by Hitler, um, certainly left wing uh, politicians, other than the missives that they were sending to family, I mean, or if you were reading the right kind of newspaper, but it was a, it was vague, you know, sort of like what Americans knew about Vietnam in the early 60s, like something that was there and maybe happening, but not really affecting your life. And, um, but even with that, you know, people knew enough about what the Nazis stood for, that they fought to not go to the Olympics. Athletes fought to not go to the Olympics. And what really, and it, they basically, to go to the Olympics, it was basically like a 51%, 49% vote. With Jesse Owens, by the way, saying that if the vote ended with not going, he wouldn't uh, cross that picket line. So um, I think that's, that's admirable of Owens, given that he was favored before the Olympics to dominate as yeah. well. He didn't come out of nowhere. Um, and um, so... And then what changed it was when Avery Brundage, the, um, who then was the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee, travels to Berlin, gets the, the Hitler Grand Tour, and comes back saying how amazing it is. Avery Brundage, notorious bigot, uh, comes back and says how great it is in Germany. And everything's fine and nobody's oppressed. And that's all a bunch of hooey by the media. Mm -hmm. you know, like he was never above that by any stretch. I mean, if he was around today, he'd be talking about globalists. But the horror, though, is the ways in which so much of today's Olympic ceremony was created in the office of Joseph Goebbels for that 1936 Olympics. I mean, the running of the torch that starts with the 36 Olympics. Uh, people marching in by country, that started with the 36 Olympics. So the pomp and the circumstance, you know, all of that Opening night, you know, the country introduces itself to the world. 36 Olympics. And that they didn't, you know, burn that to the ground and throw salt on it, I think betrays a lot in the Olympic movement. Yeah, it, you know, it's weird. Ostensibly, the Olympics is supposed to be a place where politics are put aside, where people can kind of come together as nations and just compete on a neutral playing field without animosity towards one another, just purely in this kind of environment of respectful competition. And, you know, as you've written many times now for the nation and in books and other places, uh, that is not the reality of the Olympics. And in many cases really never has been at least since 1936. Um, so we're kind of wrapping up now. I mean, I think this is a story that seems like it's not gonna go away anytime soon, unfortunately. So there'll be plenty more to talk about this. Um, but I think- That's one a quick of question, Alex. Yeah. yeah. I'm so it. sorry, but um, I during the show, I've had to do some quick uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter look and, 
Did Jalen Brown have a close relationship with Udoka or a tense relationship? So this is a matter. This is this is an interesting thing because I think I I, I am not actually sure to to push back on that slightly. I think that um, there's some evidence that Jalen Brown had a close relationship with Udoka, and there's some evidence that there might have been tension uh, in that relationship, particularly when it comes to the subject of, of who was driving the bandwagon in the Celtics organization for trading him for Kevin Durant. Which mm. was yeah, uh, a when significant is story. A key factor, yeah. So now, I, I asked I, that because um, a few minutes ago on Jalen's IG page, he just did an image of the Woj tweet with a picture yeah. of Adoka next to Kevin Durant about Adoka leaving. And so, obviously, that tweet I mean, or that that post, it really is important how he felt about Adoka because we'll interpret it from that, like, oh no, he's gone or thank God he's gone. But either way, it's kind of an intense thing to do that shows that these feelings were not in neutral. Certainly, I think that's the right read on it. I think it's very hard to unpack. I, I saw it as well. And I think it's very hard to unpack exactly what that means without additional context from Jalen. Uh, I imagine we will probably not be getting that context anytime soon. But um, I think it's fair to say that Udoka left the Celtics organization uh, in a great deal of controversy and with a lot of uh, vagueness and lack of clarity around the situation. Um, Dave, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. I ask if you guys like Missoula as, as I don't watch the Celtics because of yeah. the Celtics. So uh, far, I, so far, I think I'm, I'm fine with him. I think he's got a learning curve as all rookie coaches do, but there have been some, some things that I think have progressed nicely from last year, particularly on the offensive end that uh, I've liked what I've seen. JQ, do you have a Missoula review this early in the season? Well, like we said off air earlier, I would obviously probably quite a bit as much as he would prefer that certain elements of his past did not exist uh, as far as uh, showing some, you know, real contrition and having taken some concrete steps without being forced to, to address uh, the domestic incidents in his past. Uh, apart from that, bracketing that, which, you know, you shouldn't entirely. Uh, I've been impressed with the on-court product for the most part. There's some, you know, really obvious first-year coach uh, issues like calling timeouts, uh, like questions about what he's trying to do, when he's trying to do it in terms of the unfolding of the season. Uh, all valid criticisms, but in terms of, you know, the situation that the Celtics found themselves in and how they handled it, I think they did a pretty solid job overall, considering all those things and what we have seen so far has been pretty solid. Uh, we could go on and on about how much, you know, coaches are actually important when you have a kind of talent Boston has on the roster and all that fun stuff. But um, for me, what I would like to do before we get out of here is just, you know, put something behind everything that we said in some kind of, even just the, the loosest of frameworks of something that is actionable. Uh, at the end of Dave's article, uh, Dave, you write, let's all pledge to wake up and learn from the past, but not be shackled by it. Now that could be taken a lot of different ways. I'm curious to hear about how you think we should, you know, respond to this stuff. Yeah. I mean, and it's a, I had an argument with my editor about this. Because my editor said, well, do you want him fined? Do you want him suspended? You have to call for something actionable for Kyrie. And I said, look, I'm, I'm writing an article whose central thesis is the Jews aren't the problem. The system is the problem. And you want me to say I want the billionaires to come save us from anti-Semitism? That, that would be a weird ending to a piece like this. I mean, if I was going to do something just on the politics of fining or suspending, that's one thing. But to have a thesis like that and then be like, Joseph Tsai, only you can deliver justice. Well, give me a break. Um, and then this idea of calling for something, you know, I think of the Eugene Debs quote where he said, if I can lead you out of the wilderness, then I can lead you back in again. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm a little down on saying this is what need, we need to do, but if someone said to me, can you give an example? I mean, I think the, the young people, I don't know if they're connected to some organization that I'd find objectionable or whatever, but I think sitting in that first row with the, with the fight anti-Semitism shirts was really powerful. You know, and that's the sort of thing that actually makes a difference 
when you're talking about changing the minds of players. You know, it has to be visible. It has to be real. It has to be vibrant um, to be taken seriously as something that could really change minds. Um, yeah. So, so I, I guess that's what I would say is like, think of ways to have your voice heard as a fan, you know, whether that's social media, although God knows what that's going to look like in the weeks ahead or at the game or among your friends, talk to them about what you think is, I don't want to use the word appropriate, but what you think is above the board and what's just dirty and ugly. I think that's super important for not just the fans, but also the media to keep this conversation going. Uh, appreciate text, like textual nuance, appreciate, uh, like basically just, you know, don't just talk about Udoka as the next head coach. Talk about Udoka in the context of his own transgressions and how he's going to be able to hold people who have also transgressed accountable both on and off the court in very, very different ways. Uh, and just keep the conversation moving forward. Be a Nick Friedel. Don't be a me. <laughs> yeah, I think part of it is also, you know, as you kind of just mentioned, there needs to be some courage in reporting. Uh, I think that's one of the main things that uh, can really do this. And, you know, journalists have I, I don't want to put journalism on a pedestal as as much as I like you, Dave. <laughs> oh, please don't. <laughs> but um, you know, there there are some avenues to calling this stuff out and to educating and to opening conversations, even if those conversations are not themselves resolved by pieces or by questions or by individual press conferences. Just opening those conversations up and having them, even if they can get kind of thorny and messy is a pretty important first step. And so to that, um, I think we'll close by saying that, uh, you know, to the sports media and sports journalism, really media generally, you know, I think there's a lot of power in your hands and there's a lot of things that you can do to open these conversations and to kind of treat them in a respectful uh, and thoughtful way that kind of brings people into these conversations rather than shutting people out of these conversations, even if that's uncomfortable at times. Dave is a great example of somebody who is able to open those conversations. Uh, we're trying our best here at Celtics Lab. And, you know, I think that consider just the power of the conversation and the ability to open that conversation and consider kind of what the sports media you're consuming has to say about it and whether that media is having that conversation in good faith, because that really matters a lot to how these discussions are ultimately going to go and what action is going to come as a result of that. Dave, last word. I made two errors in oh, this yeah. podcast that I'd like to correct, sort of like the old stat boy on PTI, except sure. I'm doing it for myself. Uh, one is I said that Howard Zinn organized a Jewish basketball team. It was, by, it was totally mixed ethnic wise, mm. uh, as it would have to be to, to build a union on the shipyards. So that, I just, I just misspoke there. A and, uh, the second thing is I didn't do the Debs quote, where, right? It's if I can lead you into the promised land, that means I could lead you out. So yeah. there are some corrections. Thanks. And, and a good quote to end on Dave. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody who's listening, if you're still here, please make sure to read Dave's pieces on the nation. Give him a follow on the, I guess, soon to be useless Twitter um, and all other media platforms. And, uh, you know, like, subscribe, follow, comment. We realize this is a politically charged episode. We promise we will get back to talking basketball as soon as humanly possible. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, it's me, your Uncle Cooper. Sorry to interrupt your music. I do love music, especially when it's set at a reasonable volume. You know, music is really only as good as your speakers. The same is true for minivans. A minivan is only as good as the tires it sits on. And the button on the screen there, it agrees with me. If you click on it, it'll bring you to all the Cooper minivan tires that'll make your minivan a really good minivan. Go with the Coopers! Cooper! You're finally at that hot new spot. The one your friends keep raving about. Sitting across from your date. It's going... Another round? 
really well. And that dish you've been dying to try, oh, it's headed your way. You can smell it, hear it sizzling fresh off that skillet as it comes closer, closer, and served. Go ahead, enjoy. After your phone sneaks a bite first. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. 